Did you know that in the 1700s there was another famous A. Dot Hamilton? Did you know that it actually was illegal to print something that was true in the early 1700s? That you could get arrested and indicted for calling the governor a monkey. That your lawyer admitting that you clearly broke the law and have no defense is actually a pretty effective defense. And that the seeds of our press freedoms started all the way back in the 1730s. Did you know all of that? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out, because we'll be covering that and more in episode 24. The John Peter Zanger trial. The most important trial you've never heard of. Hello and welcome to class. Thanks so much for joining us today. So today, finally, after quite a few lessons in a row, I think four or five lessons in a row, we are doing an extra credit episode. And we are welcoming back uh, my good friend and fellow history nerd, Bill Gorman, to join me for what I think is a totally overlooked moment in American history and one that's incredibly important and actually have quite an interesting narrative to it. Uh, So, Bill, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me back, Chris. I'm sure this is a welcome break in the monotony of your voice. uh, (laughs) Yeah, of course, of course. I I bore myself with it sometimes, (laughs) so so I appreciate you hopping on. Um, But today, Bill and I are going to be diving deep into the John Peter Wenger trial of 1735. And you might be thinking, who the hell is John Peter Wenger? And that is a very fair question to be asking. And that's why we're doing this episode. You might, by the end of this episode, be a bit surprised at just how important this guy was in American history that very few people have heard of. And this case in 1735 pretty much established the principle of the freedom of press. We're talking about over half of a century before the Bill of Rights are written and the First Amendment is written. Over 50 years prior to that, we have this case that really lays the groundwork for it. And the freedom of the press is extremely important and has become part of the American identity almost throughout the years, right? Freedom of speech and freedom of press. And of course, we're in a bit of a tumultuous political landscape today in which there's a lot of controversy over the press and what they're saying and who they're talking about. But certainly having a free press is far, far better than not having one. Um, So, you know, Bill, this entire case revolves around this idea of seditious libel, which was established in 1606 in England. What is, what does seditious libel mean? Yeah. The historically, the offense of seditious libel has consisted of speech critical of government or government officials. And so, just to be clear, when when you start throwing around the word speech in a legal context, that of course could either mean oral speech as communicated from one person to another, or it can also be written. Uh, so published uh, to to any third party. So what seditious libel is really all about, though, is targeting what government officials would consider to be libelous speech. And why? Okay, so for many Americans, you know, in today's vantage point, it, it doesn't really make sense for government to outlaw like literally any speech against. A government official. Oh, Why sure. was it so important in the early 17th century for England to outlaw seditious libel? What was really the threat they were facing? Yeah, so we we all have to remember that in in today's modern era, that a defense to libel in general is the truth. But of course, when you're talking about a society like you're, like we are, 
which is 1600s uh, England, colonial England, ruled by a monarch, you have someone in power who the people had no part in electing. So you have a power structure that is dependent upon maintaining truth, their truth. And so any speech that is contrary to that is a threat to them. And that's why, uh, that's why truth is not a defense to libel in the 1600s at that, you know, at that time. Because, because the monarch, the English monarch, is, a, is afraid. That's what this. That's what I think this boils down to is that there, it's the retention of power and their their maintenance on that, and it's it's only fostered by the ability to prosecute any speech that they deem as libelous to them. So basically, to them, it doesn't matter if it's actually true, because they are primarily concerned with their power not being undermined, and so whether what's being said is true or false, if from their perspective, it's undermining their power and questioning their authority. It is then deemed illegal. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. So, so that sort of that's the situation that we're dealing with in our discussion today. This idea of seditious libel, and you basically can't say anything about a government official that he, and they were all he's pretty much at this time, that he would deem unkind unflattering, uh, inappropriate, threatening his power or authority in any way. So let's go back to the beginning of this story with John Peter Wenger. He was a gentleman who was born in 1697 in Germany. He emigrated from Germany in 1710 to the then English colonies. He lived in the colony of New York which, of course, you guys know, used to be New Netherland, quite a few Dutch there in the colony of New York. And he apprenticed a printer named William Bradford. And William Bradford was a really successful printer. Um, John Peter Wenger eventually opened up his own shop, but wasn't really able to compete with Bradford because Bradford was um, such, such an established printer at this time. So what ends up happening is... The colony of New York ends up getting a new governor. At this time, when a governor would step down or retire or was fired, and they would wait for the new governor who was appointed by the crown uh, to come over from, from the other side of the Atlantic, they would put a interim governor in his place. And there is a guy named Rip Van Dam, and there's that Dutch, right, that, that Dutch name for you. Uh, from the New Netherlands, and he fills in as interim governor. And what ends up happening is the new governor who's coming over from England is named William Cosby. And yes, there was actually a uh, governor of the new New York colony named Bill Cosby. And he arrived, and he demanded that Van Dam pay him a portion of his salary, basically because at this time, if you're interim governor... You get paid the salary, and then it was just customary to pay a portion of that to the new gov governor who came over. Well, Bill Cosby did not have a very good reputation. Uh, he was seen as a bit of a cheat. Um, he was selfish. He was uh, a braggart. He was difficult to deal with. Um, and Van Dam knew that, and Van Dam didn't want to give him the salary. So... This is going to sort of lead to some much larger philosophical questions uh, about government, right? So Cosby is uh, full of himself. He's not seen as very intelligent. He doesn't really give people the time of day. And this is, you know, just a side note. In episode 22, I referenced how the colonists seem to have quite a bit of freedom because a lot of the government officials that England appointed were incompetent. Well, this is a perfect example of one of those incompetent officials. And so Cosby is extremely upset with Van Dam, and he actually tries to get the courts. In April of 1733, he tries to, to get the courts in New York to force Van Dam to hand over the salary. And the chief justice of the New York courts at this time is a uh, 
gentleman named Lewis Morris, and he says he couldn't take the case. And the issue is, instead of just issuing his decision, he actually printed his decision in John Peter Zanger's new newspaper that he had created uh, in 1733 called the New York Weekly Journal. And he prints this like, scathing um, opinion of Cosby basically attacking him personally. And Cosby, of course, at that point is absolutely furious. Quick point, Chris. Uh, when, when you're dealing with this level of uh, incompetence that you started to see from Mr. Cosby, of course you're going to finally find some people who are equal or nearly as powerful and are willing to fight back. That being said, uh, of course, as Cosby started to butt heads with prominent leaders in the community, uh, one of them being Lewis Morris, who was the chief justice at the time, well, Cosby fired him. He fired him because Morris had uh, made a ruling that intimated uh, Cosby had uh, some financial dealings that were uh, less than above board. And so after that, Morris was dismissed by uh, Mr. Cosby. But because he was not just, you know, some Joe Schmo, so to speak, he decided to form his own faction. And he joined forces with two prominent lawyers, uh, James Alexander and William Smith. Yeah, and, and I believe they also joined forces with the former interim governor, Van Dam, too. And, but basically, they create a faction to oppose Cosby. And I mean, this gets into we, we could we could go off on a whole other discussion about the idea of the separation of powers not existing here. Right. The executive, the governor wants something to happen. The judicial branch doesn't allow it to happen. So the executive just fires the justice, which is it's crazy. almost like the founding fathers had a decent framework of understanding about all the pitfalls that they exactly. were running into that weren't uh, making for an impartial form of government. Yeah, exactly. And it also reminds us, like when we look throughout history, examples like this, if you have leaders who are genuinely threatened by other people in power speaking truthful statements, then that says, that says far more about the leader than it does the person speaking the truthful statement. Sure. And so if the leader is willing to go to a point, you know, whatever country he's in or whatever role he has, willing to go to a point to fire someone, to basically squash opposition, then you usually there's a lot more to it than you realize. And Cosby, of course, here wants to get his way and isn't getting his way. But it is having an effect, right? Because people are not stupid. People recognize corruption and incompetence when they see it. And the people of New York recognized that what Cosby was doing was wrong. The general populace was quickly turning even further against Cosby. They were buying the New York Weekly Journal. They were supporting Zanger and his faction. Yeah, let's, and, Chris, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but let, let's, make that, let's make that important point even more highlighted it's that this was a newspaper in 1735 that was the form of mass communication yeah the only yeah literally yeah, exactly. the only, the only town. so when you're trying to get a message out there uh, maybe today's equivalent would be twitter or television but in at that point in time these the alexander and smith and and that faction utilized a newspaper because the people of new york and everywhere else, because as you said, it's the only show in town, they would read the newspaper, and that's how they targeted him. And they, they targeted him uh, pretty effectively, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so let's let's get into that a little bit, because it's actually kind of humorous to look back on it now. Of course, uh, we, we, can, we can all laugh at history. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it's important to point out that Zanger was, of course, just the publisher in all of this. He was the one running the, the shop. The actual authors and the writers of these articles, these scathing reviews of Cosby, were primarily Alexander and Smith. And at, in the beginning, they started writing more uh, scholarly letters, for lack of a better term. They were writing things about uh, right to a jury trial and uh, 
and ideas like liberty, important ideas, but ideas like liberty and free speech. But yeah, you know, uh, boring, st- boring stuff. <laughs> that's, but that that was um that was basically just a warm up act because they quickly transitioned into not so veiled references uh, to the governor, uh, Governor Cosby, as a monkey, a tyrant, uh, and an overgrown criminal, uh, along with other uh, equivalent pleasantries. The paper also. Uh, severely criticized the governor for permitting a French sloop to tie up in New York Harbor. Of course, uh, a sloop, an old-fashioned word for boat. It was also suggested in the paper that the sloop was utilized for essentially espionage by the French. So, I mean, these were pretty serious claims that uh, Alexander and Smith were making. Um, and perhaps uh, in uh, in the modern equivalents the perhaps the most damning is the financial accusations and the paper made an accusation that castigated the governor for accepting a uh, monetary gift from the state assembly or the colonial assembly at that time uh, for opposing a bill that was popular in the colony pay for literal pay for play uh, yeah, this like is i mean actual yes, so, actual yeah. bribery yes actual bribery so these were all of the things that were lobbed at cosby via Zanger's newspaper. And in Zanger's newspaper, Alexander and Smith were also arguing that like, freedom of speech and freedom of press is, is essential to liberty. If you begin to take them away, you begin to erode liberty. And one thing they said that I thought w- was a great point is they argued that, quote, only the wicked governors of men dread what is said of them. The idea being that if you are a forthright, honest, and fair ruler, you're not going to be afraid of what people say of you. There are always going to be people who don't like you. But if you're doing your job well and you're doing it with good intentions, you have no need to fear uh, what's said about you. Um, so, so continuing on with this narrative, right, the New York Weekly Journal just crushes, crushes Cosby. And of course, Cosby, being the uh, thin-skinned leader that he is, is not going to allow people to just say bad things about him and not try to punch back even harder against them. So he ordered the sheriff to arrest Zanger. He actually tried to get him indicted twice, and the people of New York were like, uh, no, nah, we're good. We're definitely not indicting this guy. So he forced the sheriff to arrest him, and he claimed that like the things they were saying was undermining his authority. Therefore, it was seditious libel. So on November 17th of 1734, Zanger was arrested. The bail was set at some ridiculous price, like 380 or 400 pounds, which was way more than Zanger could reasonably afford, which, you know, it just goes to show that the court system at, at this time was working in favor of Cosby and against Zanger. And he actually sat in jail for over eight months after the trial was all said and done. It ended up being close to 10 months. And of course, this is only going to help his cause with the sympathies of the people because he's sitting in jail rotting and they know he shouldn't be and it just gets everyone even more worked up. So it probably ended up working out better for him. So there Zanger is in the summer of 1735, sitting in jail awaiting his trial. And for the First time, really, we're going to have a groundbreaking case in English colonial law, and we'll get back to that trial, which is actually quite an interesting trial and how it goes down right after this. Hey, fellow history nerds. It's great to be back on the podcast. I just wanted to let you know that if you'd like to participate in this lesson or any lesson, please feel free to raise your hand and reach out via Twitter, Facebook, to let us know what you think about the podcast. In order for as many people as possible to learn more about the history of the United States, please also consider leaving a review on iTunes and subscribing to the show. By subscribing, you can get episode updates downloaded automatically to your device. I love listening to them on airplanes when I'm on uh, traveling for work. It's a great way to kill some time and learn something all at the same time. Uh, so let's get back to the podcast. Open up those notebooks. All right, so let's get back to it, Bill. That was quite a long-winded 
um, commercial break we had there. Uh, I'm very passionate you're, you're, about the podcast and about our listeners. And yeah, you you were very excited about that. You kept going on and on, so I'm sure they appreciated that. Anyway, welcome back. So let's jump into the trial here. And Bill, do you want to talk about how the trial began and what was going on? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's take it from a point you just made, Chris, which is the governor actually tried to have Zanger indicted twice in front of a grand jury, two times. And the grand jury said no, right? So Cosby had to go back to the drawing board. And so he basically said, forget, forget going in front of a grand jury. We're, I'm not going back again. So he had Zanger arrested on what's called on an information. So think about uh, in, the, in the civil context, basically a complaint. A list of a list of charges in the criminal context. That's how we got him. I want to make this perfectly clear that the fact that he could not get a grand jury to indict him is the the most twice. Yeah, twice is the best foreshadowing we have to the ultimate outcome of how a jury will find in this case. Um, Be, there's an old expression. What, what is the what is the common phrase about yeah, grand jury indictment? The, uh, a prosecutor could indict a ham sandwich. And real quick, Bill, still today, in a grand jury indictment, the point of the grand jury indictment in theory is to weed out frivolous lawsuits so people who are charged with really no no evidence don't actually have to go to court. But you can't defend yourself in a grand jury indictment. That's, you just have to sit there and correct. listen to the prosecutor just rip you to pieces. So, yeah, the only people who are allowed to put on a call it case, for lack of a better word, is the prosecution. The defense yeah. offers nothing. Yeah. So, so, the why, yeah. so the fact that without even being able to defend himself, they didn't indict him twice, yeah, that, that's pretty powerful as to how, how the people viewed this case. So let's talk just some ter quick terminology, and I'm not going to bore you with too many, too many legal concepts or anything like that, but there are, there, are a couple, <laughs> there are a couple that are pretty important to this. The first one is libel. So you might have heard the expression that slander is spoken, libel is written. So that's just basically dividing up the two types of defamation. So what does that mean? Slander, it's the spoken word, makes perfect sense. Libel, it has to be written and then communicated, uh, distributed, published via a third party. And uh, so that's, what, that's really what we're dealing with. We're dealing with libel in this, in this instance. And at this time, we've talked about it briefly, but truth was not a defense. And this will come up later, later in the trial. So we have Zanger now in front of a jury uh, in, in trial, not grand jury, in front yeah, of- Like a, an actual jury. Yeah, this, is, this is an actual case. This is an actual jury in front of an actual judge. And Zanger's initial lawyers representing him in this case were our old friends, Alexander and Smith. Unfortunately, they also knew that the truth was not a defense to seditious libel. So putting aside the legal dogma that if, uh, or when I should say, when the law is against you, argue the facts, they went a slightly different route. And they decided to attack the judge, which um, is never super advisable. Uh, but they challenged his just his authority, frankly. Is that he, your official legal opinion? Is it, never super advisable? It is just That's more good. of a general rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah. uh, they challenged the authority of the judge because he was boys with Cosby. There you go. That I more, mean, so, more formal formal phrasing. Great. <laughs> That's that's my law school education in, in action. <laughs> right there you there. go. So I, I am assuming at this point you can tell where this is headed. Uh, the judge did not take too kindly to the line of attack that Alexander and Smith were were proceeding down, and those those two attorneys were summarily dismissed. Not only dismissed, but I, I believe they were temporarily disbarred, so they weren't even allowed to practice law. So at this point, Wenger's been in, in jail for eight or nine months. Um, both of his attorneys have been fired, basically, from representing him. And the judge clearly is a pro-Cosby judge. Uh, you know, so nothing seems to be breaking his way. And when the trial begins, 
August 4th of 1735, really all they have to do is prove, right, that Wenger published it. Because it, you know, what was written in the newspaper, according to the law, is clearly illegal. Like, that is seditious liable. They were speaking out against a government official, and they were saying insulting things about a government official. I mean, it was an open and shut case if you really could could ever find one. So all they had to do was prove that Wenger printed the information, and that's not hard to do because, you know, he's the publisher of the newspaper. Yeah, William Glendon write, wrote in the New York State Bar Journal about the process that you were just describing, Chris. Uh, while a defendant was entitled to a jury trial, the prosecution had only to prove that he had printed and published the libel. The judge, usually in the government camp, would then instruct the jury that the words were scandalous, libelous, a threat to public order, and that they could therefore find the defendant guilty. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, the judge would then just, yeah, they would, so the judge would just tell the jury what to say, more or less, right? And so that's where we are. And right at the beginning of this case, the crazy thing is that a man named Chambers, who is going to be Wenger's new attorney, argued that there really wasn't any proof that anyone had actually been libel because in his mind, libel is a false claim. And he's wrapping up sort of his opening statement where he's not really putting up much of a defense here. And some old guy stands up in the crowd and actually, I mean, like you can't make this stuff up. He stands up in the crowd and asks the judge if he can join the defense of John Peter Zenger. And the judge, who likely had no idea what was happening at the time, made the crucial error of allowing this to happen. Because this old guy was Andrew Hamilton, and no, no relation to Alexander Hamilton, all right? Um, but it was Andrew Hamilton who was arguably the best lawyer in all of the colonies. He had been recruited by Alexander and Smith to come down. He had been prepped with all the material, so he was ready to go. And the judge made the mistake of allowing him to join Wenger's defense team, and now all of a sudden John Peter Wenger has arguably the best attorney in the colonies representing him, which is pretty crazy that, that this happened. Okay, so now Zanger has gone through three attorneys. Uh, some, not really his fault. None of it was really his fault, right? Uh, but yeah. three attorneys have had to be rotated in and out on this case. But now, now he's got the, the Ted Olson of his day, the David Boys, uh, for all you big law nerds out there who are also crossing over into the history nerd space. So Andrew Hamilton, he, he stands before the court and he immediately concedes that Zanger had printed and published the offending papers, but demanded that the prosecution prove them false. And what did the attorney general say in response? No, it's over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, they, that's it. Yeah. He said, yeah, we Richard have Bradley basically said, you know, he was probably a bit shocked and was like, did I? Okay, great. I won. He, okay, he, I won. Yeah. He <laughs> says, we have nothing to prove because of that. Technically, that, that's the law. We have nothing to prove. And that's seizing on the logic of the government's position that the truth was worse than a lie. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's tough sledding for Mr. Hamilton at this point. But he does have a leg to stand on because the indictment that was handed down said that Wenger had published, quote, a certain false, malicious, and seditious scandalous libel. So it says false in the indictment. And that, I think, is what Hamilton really clung on to by saying he's indicted for writing things that are untrue. But actually, yeah, he was critical, but everything he wrote was, was true. And I, I'll prove to you that it was true. I think we're, we're obviously hung up on the fact that, like, in, in our modern world, we're like, if it's true, then it can't be libelous. It's yeah. an ultimate defense. Unfortunately, as the attorney general gets into again, he says, the law, in my opinion, is very clear. They cannot be admitted. This is the evidence of, uh, of the truth of the statements. They cannot be admitted to justify a libel, provide the authorities I have already read to the court. It is not 
the le- it is not less reliable because it is true. And he and the attorney general being a fine litigator said or indicated rather he did not want to dignify the argument any further. They so get- this is one where clearly Mr. Hamilton is starting to get under the skin of the attorney general. So uh, Hamilton could never even bring in any of his evidence. He couldn't even really argue the truth of these statements because it wasn't even allowed. So when you're faced with impossible odds, you're you're looking for a Hail Mary, to use a football term. Uh, and what the, so what does Hamilton do? He knows he can't make the legal argument. He knows he can't introduce the facts and circumstances. But what does he know? And Chris, you brought it up earlier. He knows the people of New York know what a sleaze ball Cosby is. Yeah. And how incompetent he is. It's a given. He everyone knows how bad this guy is. He's terrible. So what does Hamilton do? He makes an appeal directly to the people of New York. In this case, the gentleman of the jury. And he completely disregards the instructions from the judge, the chief justice, and goes directly to the jury and essentially asks them to disregard what the law is, in so many words, and find his client, Zanger, not guilty. Because the law in this instance is incorrect. If we look at what Hamilton says to the jury, here's his quote, quote, if you should be of the opinion that there is no falsehood in Mr. Zanger's papers, you ought to say so. It is your right to do so. And there is much depending on your resolution. The question and, before the court and you, gentlemen of the jury, is not of small or private concern. It is not the cause of one poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it may in its consequence affect every free man that lives under a British government on the main of America. It is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty. He is doubling down on their sense of justice. Yeah. I mean, he, he starts in, in, in this foray with, you know, gentlemen of the jury. It is now, he puts it on them. He puts it on them, which is, is excellent lawyering. He says, gentlemen of the jury, it is you we must now appeal for witnesses to the truth of the facts that we have offered and are denied the liberty to prove. I yeah. think you're. I think you're exactly right to cite that phrase, Chris. And 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 yeah, I also wanted to add this one because he's he's appealing directly to their sense of justice and playing on the fact they know that Cosby is a dirtbag. Yeah, and and what he's doing also is he's empowering them, right? He's making their decision far greater than a decision that's just going to affect John Peter Vanger or even the colony of New York. He's basically saying you have the power to change the course of how these cases are tried. Like, we can set a precedent here in this court that could affect every single colonist throughout the English colonies. And that's exactly what happened, because the jury went back for 10 minutes, deliberated for 10 minutes, came back, not guilty. And everyone freaked out. They threw a huge party for um, old man Hamilton that night, and it was just a joyous occasion uh, at that time. And that gets into, you know, one more legal term, Bill, that I was hoping you would touch on is the idea of jury nullification, because that's really what happened here in this case. So the idea of jury nullification still exists today. Um, And it's the notion that the jury will find in, in a criminal context that the jury will find the defendant not guilty, even though they know that by the letter of the law, the defendant is guilty. Gotcha. And, and so of course, we, there are all types of external considerations that lead to jury nullification. Yes. In, in, in most part, that, that's really how jo- jury nullification comes, comes about, right? Is the, there are external pressures, whether, um, I, I mean, people speculate all the time about which, which cases um, were, were affected by the concept of jury nullification, perhaps most famously uh, the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, where um, the members, it's been speculated that uh, race obviously played into that into that yeah. case a little bit. Uh, so jury nullification is not a foreign concept even to today's justice system. Gotcha. Good. Well, th- yeah, thanks for that. So now that we take 
you know, take a step back from this case. And now let's think about, because there's a reason you and I chose to do this case. We both think it's critically important in English colonial and then American history. Um, and historians go back and forth on this, but it is pretty, it's pretty widely considered to be a, a monumental moment in American history by most historians, with every historian. There are a lot of contrarians out there just for the sake of being contrarian. It's the cool thing to do. It's the cool yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. We, we're, we're not those people. We're not those people. We're a conformist for sure. <laughs> but, um... So uh, to, to gauge my thoughts, we should really start at, um, at what was written then a few decades later. So I'm just going to read a quick passage. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the press. To, like you were saying, to, to most historians. And, and, and that's, the, I, that's the fir First Amendment. That's the First Amendment. Thank okay, you just clearing that up. Just clearing that's that the up. First Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the United, United States Constitution. And uh, so to most historians, and I think to you and I, we look at the Zanger case as one of the first moments where the, 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 the groundswell of support for a uh, a concept of free of a free press enters the American colonial ideals. There are records of jury nullification for free press cases littering around in in, in 1730s. Right. This was something yeah. that when you start talking about jury nullification, this was one of the reasons or one of the types of cases that a jury nullification uh, could result in. And so, but but the Zanger case is notable because of the circumstances in Hamilton and all, and all of the rest, all the other elements of, of this particular case. But you can draw a line from Zanger through the revolution, through you know our founding fathers, to our First Amendment protections of the freedom of the press. And I think that's why we're singling this this out. Yeah, and, and I think that you know there, there's very clearly a line between John Pierre Zanger his trial and the First Amendment. But I also think there are some some other things going on here. I, I think that this was this gave for the English colonies an opportunity to pave their own path, so to speak, um, to create their own local laws and to have an impact directly on their everyday lives. And I think that they recognize that, right? So after this trial Cases of seditious libel in the colonies almost never happened, like at all. And when they did happen, people weren't convicted. And the law never changed. The law stayed the same. But the culture totally changed in the colonies to the point where English government officials recognized it's not even worth bringing people a trial for this. So it did have a very tangible and even proven impact when you just look at the sheer statistics. Um, Governor Morris, who was a founding father, yet his name is Governor. He wasn't actually like a governor, but that's his name. It's crazy. But he said, quote, the trial of Zanger in 1735 was the germ of American freedom, the morning star of that liberty, which subsequently revolutionized America. I mean, those are powerful words from a very influential founding father. So these men recognized, they knew about Zanger, they were well-read, they recognized how important this case was, and of course they added in the very first amendment to the Constitution, they, add them, they added specifically not just freedom of speech, but also freedom of press. And of course, okay, what, what else comes from this? Separation of powers, right? You don't want an executive like firing uh, someone judicial branch or trying to bribe them or pressure them, bully them into doing something. Um, trial by jury, right? Trial by jury is clearly shown how important a trial by jury is here. And then you can even say like maybe, uh, you know, right to an attorney also. Um, although that was never really, never really in doubt in this case. So I, I think it is extremely important. You know, there have been more clarifications on this moving forward in American history, something we'll talk about, you know, not too far in the future during John Adams' one, one and only term as president in 1798, he passed a Sedition Act. Basically, he was angry with how the Democratic Republicans were talking smack about him, 
and it was undermining him. And what he thought, it was undermining the security of America. So he actually passed a Sedition Act. And people spoke out extremely strongly against the Sedition Act, which is sort of ironic, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing, nothing happened to them. Um, for the most part, very few people were actually arrested here. But famously, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson spoke out against the Sedition Act, which is always coupled with uh, the Alien Act. The Alien and Sedition Acts is usually how they're phrased. And they actually allowed the law to expire the first year into Jefferson's term. So they recognized it was a bad law, it was an unconstitutional law, and it was un-American. And I don't think without the established norms of the past 60 or 70 years up to that point of the freedom of the press, do you have people speak out so confidently against it and then allow it to so quickly expire? As you pack up your things, I'd like you to take note of this idea that the colonists are creating their own identity here in the colonies. Because throughout the 1700s, the colonists are going to feel quite a kinship with England and a connection with England, especially with regards to, you know, fighting with them against the French and commercial transactions with England. But there is going to be an American identity that's slowly being created in the colonies that will bubble bubble up more and more throughout the 18th century and, of course, leading to the revolution. And this is an example of that. The colonists throughout the 18th century, as we talked about last episode, felt like they were at times a forgotten population in England. And they wanted to make sure that the power of parliament and the power of the king did not extend to the colonies in a way that would in, inhibit their ability to live their lives freely as free Englishmen. And I think that the trial of John Peter Vanger is a perfect example of that. Well, Bill, thanks so much for joining me. Listeners, thanks so much for listening. Hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. All right, next week we will be back with another episode. Um, unfortunately, Bill and Zach will not be with me. It will just be me, and we will be talking about the Great Awakening and what impact that begins to have on the colonists and how that furthers this theme of the colonists finding their own identity throughout the early and mid-18th century. All right, see you then. know that there was another famous A. Ham in the 1700s? That makes no sense out of context. For the... A. Hamilton, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, you should have said that. A. Ham? I would be like, what's he talking about? It's from the letters Hamilton wrote. They don't know that. That's why they're right, listening fine, to the fine, podcast. Fine, fine, fine. <clears throat> Three... <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair point. That's on me. That's on me. Okay.